we have last question for Dr. Sashank to summarize everything is, in your view, how will the NEP impact or drive India 2047 vision? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, draw from uh, what Mithilji mentioned uh, in the inaugural session, uh, that the national education policy uh, 2020 is like the uh, 1991 moment of the new industrial policy uh, that transformed uh, India's uh, liberalization, privatization, and globalization landscape and uh, unshackled Indian industry to become globally competitive to an extent that today we can aspire to be Atmanirbhar as is the vision of the nation. Uh, I'd also like to reflect on uh, what uh, Professor Singh mentioned, that the audience here consists of leaders of uh, universities and higher educational institutions. So I'd like to cover a few points which capture on the macro role uh, that higher educational institutions and higher education per se can play and how NEP enables us to do that. Because uh, believe me, higher education as a system, as a phenomenal role to play in the task of nation building. Uh, while a lot of micro issues were discussed, I'd like to draw your attention to a few macro issues and opportunities. Mm. Uh, firstly, I would like to quote from the UNESCO report, which mentioned that in the next 30 years, more students would be passing through the portals of higher education than ever before since the beginning of recorded history. And in this number, India will be contributing the maximum number of students. From 20 universities, 1.75 lakh students and 0.7% GER in 1950, today we are 1,043 universities, over nearly 4 crore students and 27% GER at the national level. Now we are wanting to double this and take it to 50% GER, which means 8 crore students in the higher education system, which means effectively in the Amrit Kaal of the next 25 years, 100 crore students from India will be passing through the portals of higher education in some form or the other. Are we ready for that? That's the first point I want to mention. Second, who is the customer of the higher education system? Is it the nation? Uh, the nation uh, draws its check on the bank of the higher education system. Is the nation getting what it deserves? Second, are the students the customers of the higher education system? If they are, are they getting the knowledge and the skills that will empower them to live comfortably, confidently, in a contributing fashion? Third, are the employers the customers of higher education? If yes, are we providing them with manpower that can be deployed and not just employed? While statistics show that we are having problems even with basic levels of employment. And lastly, is the taxpayer one of the key stakeholders in higher education? Because he or she is looking for fellow citizens who can contribute to the nation and also be responsible and sensitive citizens. So the higher education system needs to define its jobs towards each of these stakeholders. The third point I would like to cover is on what are India's requirements for Amrit Kaal? One, I think the point of demographic dividend mentioned enough number of times is very vital. And I don't want to dwell more on that. That's amply proven. Second, skilled workforce through multidisciplinary higher education. Multidisciplinary was defined in great detail along with interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary. But the skilled workforce, a point which probably has not been touched is what kind of skills do we need? Even the title of this particular session is of the digital age. The skills that we need in the digital age are not just the digital skills, but several other skills where digital tools and techniques will help us succeed. Complex problem solving, collaboration, communication, critical thinking, creativity, negotiation, decision making, and ethical orientation. These are the core skills the World Economic Forum has identified as skills required for success in the 21st century. Third, alignment with the SDGs. In the Amrit Kaal, as India grows to become the third largest economy by purchasing power parity and nominal GDP, and as we work towards our goal for net zero emissions, 
every aspect of our growth story will have to be in alignment with the SDGs and the higher education system will have to play a very important role. The fourth and most important is all of this will have to be based on Indian value systems, our culture and heritage. Uh, in the morning, uh, Professor Sharma had mentioned about the Delors Commission of 1996, which spoke about education as discovering the treasure within. And there are four aspects to that. And before I talk about how NEP addresses that, let me just quickly connect that with what is the common jargon today. It talks about learning to know, which is what we talk about as IQ. It talks about learning to do, which we, talks about, which we talk about as skills. It talks about learning to live together, which is what is EQ. And it talks about learning to be, which is about SQ. So if we want to create a workforce which is going to be helping us achieve our vision for Amrit Kal, they will need IQ with skills, they will need EQ, and they will need SQ. And it is towards this end, the national education policy plays a phenomenal role. It goes beyond the burden of Macaulay, which had been forcing us to think in a particular way for one and a half centuries, helps us achieve the aspirations of North America and Western Europe in terms of excellence in higher education, but also draw from the phenomenal experience of our ancient Indian education system from the likes of Nalanda, Takshashila, Odantapuri, Vallabhi, Ujjaini, and many others. And the NEP very clearly focuses on three areas, access, quality, and future readiness. Each of these through its five pillars have already been discussed. But there's one point which was missed out, which I am particularly very passionate about, which has been elaborated in NEP, and which will play a very important role for India at 2047. And that is what is referred to as holistic education. Holistic education has been focused on in four broad areas in the NEP. And as leaders of your universities, I would like to draw your attention as to how you may wish to integrate this in everything that you do, whether teaching, research, or outreach. First, sustainability or environmental awareness for nature. Second, nation building through cultivation of human values like truth, righteousness, peace, love, and nonviolence, and citizenship values. Three, contribution to the community through community service, or what has been referred to in NEP as SEVA. And four, individual competence through multicultural competence and empathy. All these four have been mentioned in NEP, and all these four will play a vital role where we can use research, innovation and entrepreneurship in order to address the socio-economic challenges that face India because our challenges in India along with economic success and employment are in these four broad areas and educational institutions can play a very important role. I'll conclude with my last point which provides you some food for thought on what is the role of higher education institutions per se in achieving the vision for India at 2047. A lot has, has been discussed in media, in, in discussed study circles and several other platforms on whether national education policy is going to help. Any policy is as good as its implementation. And any implementation and its success can be measured from the outputs, outcomes, and the impact that it creates in the short term, medium term, and long term. So I would like to share three things which higher educational institutions can leverage NEP to deliver. One, I think educating several generations of students in the next 25 years, as I have said, 100 crore students will be passing through the portal, whether as a certificate course, or a diploma course, or an undergrad, or an honors, or a postgrad, or a PhD, or a postdoc, and of course the lifelong learning opportunities, which are going to be vital, because as a Niti Aayog report says, in uh, 2020, while we are providing skills to a crore odd students that are 
passing through the higher education phase, but the huge chunk of those that need to be upskilled and reskilled are not having the kind of benefit that we should give. So higher education institutions can play a very important role in knowledge and skills. Second, I think it's very important to empower students and faculty to translate the ideas into ventures that can contribute to the economy and livelihoods. We are very often thinking of education as a standalone job of providing degrees and making the individuals employable. But I think 90% of our focus should be on how we can enable the individuals and their ideas to provide employment to crores out there who are wanting to be economically contributing. I'll give the example of the US where over $600 billion and over $1 trillion in revenue were $600 billion to GDP and $1 trillion in revenue were contributed through, and through creation of 4.5 million jobs only through the commercialization of research and tech transfer through higher educational institutions. This is a phenomenal contribution and opportunity for Indian universities to look at that lens. And the last I'll talk about as an opportunity for uh, higher educational institutions is to solve the problems and challenges that the nation is facing. I think higher educational institutions should look at themselves as citadels of knowledge. If we look back in time, along with defense and economic success, the third pillar which makes any great nation is higher education. It's the power of the Oxford and the Cambridge which makes UK a leader for 1,000 years. It's the power of the Harvards and the MITs which makes USA a leader for the last four centuries. It's the power of the Beijing and the Xinhua and other universities in China which are powering its economic success for the last 25 years. And India, way back for 2,000 years, contributed one-third to global GDP by the power of its higher education institutions like Nalanda and Takshashila and several others where the Indonesian ambassador mentioned that there were people from across the world coming in and studying. So higher education institutions can address areas of national importance where you can contribute because you are not just providing degrees and jobs, you are helping the nation achieve its broader objectives for its centenary year. Strategic areas, whether it's aerospace or advanced materials. Areas with an economic impact, whether it's green energy or sunrise industries. Emerging fields like bioinformatics, AI, IoT, 3D. Post-pandemic issues like epidemiology, virology, and vaccinology. And most important, as the NEP highlights, Lokavidya, the vidya or the knowledge which is inherent in our native skills, in our tradition, in our culture. And we have a president from the tribal community now, the tribal society provides such phenomenal insights into how we have been one with nature for several millennia. So Loka Vidya and Indian knowledge systems is again an area which NEP has highlighted. Higher education institutions have the power to contribute and develop knowledge and become the treasure house of knowledge in these areas where providing degrees and education to students would be one role, but contributing to the nation for 2047 and beyond will be a far more important role. And I'm sure the NEP is playing a very important role in providing their roadmap. And I wish all success to our universities to achieve that objective. Thank you for the opportunity. So I think with this, the summary has been well established by Dr. Shoshank.